Luke, the 10th chapter, beginning at verse 16 and reading through verse 20. The King James text today reads, He that heareth you, heareth me. And he that despiseth you, despiseth me. And he that despiseth me, despiseth him that sent me. And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Hallelujah. Fearless today. If you bow your heads with me one more time. Master, once again, O oh God, we come boldly before the throne of grace as the Word of God declares. It is our privilege as children of God. We're grateful, Lord, for the Word of God. We're grateful for the Spirit of God. We understand the truth of your word that where the word of God is mixed and mingled with the spirit of God, truth can be found. Lord, you do not find truth alone in the spirit, nor do you find truth alone in the printed page. It's imperative, O oh God, that we read and understand the printed word as we are guided and directed and led by the Holy Ghost. For you are the author and you are the finisher of our faith. And who better to help us understand what is written than the one who wrote it. Master anoint today the man of God. Help me Lord to deliver this word to your people. Lord if ever there has been a time in human history when the church so desperately needed to hear from heaven, that time is now. We need to hear from you, Lord. We need to hear from the Word of God. Speak to the church. Anoint my feeble lips of clay. Anoint the ears of all who hear. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God in Amen. Many people do not understand that human emotion is a gift that God has given to the human race which is not altogether shared by the rest of the animal kingdom. If you notice a dog can hurt itself, bless its heart, and you'll see it kind of limping along. But you don't see it cussing and yelling and screaming and hollering and being angry that it's hurt itself. You don't see animals in the wild behaving as human beings so often behave. We alone are able to express ourselves in so many different ways through the realms of human emotion. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I am convinced that psychiatry and psychology and similar fields are really secular means whereby um, people deal with spiritual issues. You see, our emotional makeup is very much tied to our spiritual makeup. And where we're at emotionally often uh, is 
emblemic of where we are spiritually. If you want to understand uh, somebody's spiritual condition, then oftentimes you need to understand where they're at emotionally. And psychology and psychiatry are men's uh, way of trying to deal with things spiritual. And that's why I think we have to be very careful when delving into these areas. But if there is any one emotion that human beings can fall into and find themselves victim to more quickly and more powerfully than any other emotion, it is the emotion of fear. We are abundantly subject to fear. It doesn't take much to make a human being a human being fearful. We're fearful often of the unexpected. We're fearful of what comes next when we don't know what is next to come. You know, it's one thing when you know what tomorrow holds. It's another thing when you have no idea what tomorrow holds. And fear will often grip the child of God when they are uncertain about the future. Fear grips us when we face the, the uh, ultimate end, which is death. Death is something that causes many people great fear and great anxiety. The human race in general very much prefers not ever to talk about death. We don't ever want to discuss it. That is a subject matter that we feel is best ignored and left untouched and let's just leave it over there and we'll deal with it when the time comes. And as anyone knows, like Martin, who sells uh, pre-planning for funerals and stuff, as anyone knows who's in the funeral industry, uh, it really would behoove you, it really would benefit you, if you would learn not to be fearful of death and deal with it and address it and talk about it while you're alive and well. Because if you wait, until death comes, be it the death of your spouse, be it the death of a child, be it the death of a parent uh, or a friend. When the actual event occurs, folks, uh, you are not in the best frame of mind at that moment then to deal with issues that are related to that occurrence. So it's really best if you can get past your fear and learn to deal with some of these issues in advance. You know, some people don't want to talk about things like advanced directives. If mom or dad were uh, seriously ill and they were in a position where machines were keeping them alive, would they want uh, those machines to be kept going? Or would they want artificial means of life preservation to be turned off so they could go ahead and move on into eternity? So often we are so filled with fear concerning these topics that we don't even want to address them. Fear is a powerful emotion. Fear is something that can help us in that there are times when our fears will cause us to stop and rethink a decision or rethink a move. Sometimes our fear will cause us to be more careful and more cautious. But more often than not, fear is able to paralyze us and force us into indecision and, and inability to make any move in any direction. Fear is a powerful thing. When I talk to the church about spiritual warfare, or when you watch these programs on television that deal with the paranormal and the supernatural, it always amazes me. And, and Tommy can tell you I frequently laugh 
when I'm watching some of these so-called ghost hunters doing their job and then all of a sudden they hear a noise or they see something and they jump out of their skin and all of a sudden they're screaming like a little girl running down the hallway for the first exit they can find because they've been terrified well excuse me but are you not in that field is are you is not what you're doing something that is going to open you up to these kind of experiences would you not be at least a little bit anticipating that something like this might occur seems kind of ridiculous that you'd be going into pitch blackness and you would be depriving all of your senses of any uh, anything at all and then when you hear something or you see something you jump out of your skin and scream you know what sense does that make what's interesting is in our primary text today the disciples of the Lord came back to him and they were so excited because something had happened in their experience that had never happened before you see in the past if they came upon someone who was demon possessed in the past if they came upon a situation where demonic powers were at work it might have caused them to become paralyzed with fear. It might have caused them to become terrorized. But all of a sudden, the disciples of the Lord realized, wait a minute, things have changed. Now when I come upon a demon, no matter how scary a face they put on, no matter how terrifying a voice they cause, to come out of the mouth of the one who is possessed. I have found that through the name of the Lord Jesus, that demon has to listen to me. Uh -huh. Oh, hallelujah, that has to be exciting. All of a sudden, something that at one time would have caused them tremendous fear and anxiety and great trepidation all of a sudden they found that they need not be fearful i've got news for you today church i've got news for you today believer as a child of god you have no need to fear hallelujah whatever your circumstance whatever your situation whatever you're looking at whatever you're staring down today the fact of the matter is God has provided for us so that we need not be fearful. Hallelujah. He has provided through the blood of Jesus Christ not only a means whereby we may be saved throughout eternity, but He has provided a means, oh listen to me now, where we can live fearlessly in the here and now so many of the things that otherwise cause people fear and anxiety as a child of god we need not be fearful hallelujah i remember lane it's been almost 20 years ago this coming august through october it will have been 20 years ago that I was lying in a hospital bed at Yale New Haven Hospital in New Haven, Connecticut. I was dying. The doctors knew I was dying. They were trying to figure out what was causing the problem, but they couldn't identify it. This is even before I went in to the hospital for a, a two-month stretch and wound up on life support for a month. Even before that hospitalization, I spent three different hospitalizations during the summer of uh, 2001 at Yale New Haven, and they were trying to figure out why I was losing so much weight, why food was not digesting, why 
I was just, you know, wasting away to nothing. And they, for the life of them, they couldn't figure out what was going on. And doctor after doctor, of course, it's a teaching hospital. So you've got all these, I hate teaching hospitals. Give me a hospital where you don't have a bunch of students coming through all the time. Talk about not being able to get any rest and not, oh my goodness, try to be in a teaching hospital. It's ten times worse than any other hospital because you got all these student doctors running loose. And every one of them's wanting to put in their time and trying to book some experience with patients. And I had all these young doctors, these student doctors who would come in and they would talk to me. There was one group, they were studying psychiatry and psychology. And this one group of young people came in and of course the doctor who's much older, who is teaching them and leading them, came in with them and he's showing them you know how you're supposed to do well hello Miss Tomorrow how are you today well I've been better are you in any pain well some but I'm okay at the moment sir may I ask you are you aware that you may die boy that conversation took a big turn all of a sudden didn't it and I looked at him and I said, yes, sir, I'm aware of that. And of course, being the smart aleck that I am, I said, it's going to happen sometime, so, you know, why not now rather than later? It's going to come, so what difference does it make if it's today or tomorrow? He said, well, how do you feel about that? I said, well, I feel fine. I said, I'm ready. I'm good to go. My bags are packed. I said, I'm all set. I've got my ticket for eternity. I've put all my uh, all of my bets on Jesus, and I believe with everything that's in me that it's going to pay off. So I'm ready. Well, that group of young people left, and after a couple of hours, one of the young doctors who had been part of that group came back to the room. And he said, you may remember I was with that group of uh, psychiatric, psychiatry students a little while ago. I said, yes, sir, I remember. He said, would you mind if I sat and talked to you for a while? I said, sure. Anybody who knows me knows that talking is not uh, something I generally have a hard time doing. So I said, yeah, by all means. So he sat down and we began to talk. And he said, you know, he said, when we were in here earlier, he said, I was really taken aback by your response to Dr. So-and-so's asking you if you were aware that you may die. He said, I mean, you really understand that from a medical perspective, they don't really know what to do with you, and they don't really know they don't have any answers and therefore there's a good possibility that you may die before any answers are found and I said uh-huh he said when you answered him he said I've got to tell you he said there was this sense of peace and this sense of assurance that I felt emanating from you he said where does that come from? Where do you get that from? He said, how in the world do you know how many people we talk to who are dying? And we ask them a similar question, he said, and they break down in tears. Or they express anger, or they express fear, that they're filled with fear and terror. He said, and you on the other hand, he said, you just took it in stride like it was just a walk through the park. He said, where does that come from? I said, young man, I'm going to tell you something. I'm a preacher of the gospel. I'm a Christian. I've been born again. I've been baptized in Jesus' name. been filled with the Holy Ghost. I said, I know God in a way, and in an intimate way, that I can't even begin to describe to you. 
I said, God is as real as the nose on my face. And if God is as real to me as that in life, why in the world should I doubt Him in death? I said, no, I believe in the cross. I believe in the empty tomb. I believe in the ascended Christ. I believe God answers prayer. I said, I also believe there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. And that if you have come to God through the Lord Jesus Christ according to the Scriptures, that after death, there is nothing at all negative awaiting you. He said, you've got a glorious future awaiting you. I said, I've been preaching this for decades. I said, I've got news for you. I don't preach nothing I don't believe. I preach what I know and I know what I preach. I said, I believe every word I say. And he just looked at me and he says, really? I mean, to that degree, you don't have any doubt? And I said, no, I don't have any doubt. No. I'm ready. Good to go. That young man sat and talked to me for a couple of hours. And then after a while he said, well, I guess I need to go ahead and get going. He said, but I sure have enjoyed this and I've never talked to anybody that had the mindset and the attitude that you have about death. He said, I really wanted to explore that some more. And I said, well, yeah, I said, your shift will probably be ending shortly. And he said, oh, my shift ended over an hour ago. He said, I've just been sitting here enjoying our conversation. So you see, people are so accustomed to a fearful response to death. They're so accustomed to human beings being fearful and being anxious about death that when this young man was faced with somebody who genuinely, sincerely didn't have a lick of fear in him, he didn't know what to do with himself. He was taken aback. He was shocked. And he had to learn more. He had to understand more. Oh, I'm here to tell you, folks, as a child of God, there is nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. Hallelujah. Nothing to fear. The one thing that causes people the greatest amount of fear is the invisible or the unknown. When you start dealing with the supernatural, when you start dealing with the paranormal, people become very fearful very fast. And you'll hear them say on these various programs on television, well, how do you fight something you can't see? You know, when something can touch you and you don't even see it, you, don't, you can't even know it's there. When something can scratch you or hurt you or push you and you can't even see it, oh, that just causes so much much fear. And I watch these shows and I think to myself, as a child of God, it doesn't cause me any fear. Because first of all, as a child of God, that thing that is invisible, that thing that is spiritual, hasn't got the authority or the power to touch me or to come near me or to bother me in any way, shape, size, or form. And if I know it, listen to me now, if I know that, they know it. If I don't know that, they will take advantage of my ignorance. The thing that causes so many believers today so much anxiety and so much fear in their lives is not that God has not already made them an overcomer, that God has not already given them power and authority over sickness, over uncertainty, over death, over demons, but rather the fact that they do not walk in that knowledge. I have a problem when it comes to people contacting me, wanting me to cast out demons, and I've said this many, many times, 
I do no one a service by casting a demon out of their life or out of their body. I do not do them a service whatsoever. If they leave having been delivered and they possess the same mindset and the same understanding that they came in with, I have done nothing for them except open them up to a bigger, worse experience. You've got to be careful, folks. A lot of people think, well, bless God, if somebody's got a demon, the preacher just supposed to cast that demon out. That's his obligation. That's his responsibility. That's what he's supposed to do. Not if that preacher has any wisdom. Not if that preacher knows how to walk in the Holy Ghost. No! If I do that and that person is delivered and they still have the same thought processes and the same mindset that they had when they first came into me, then all I've done is cleaned up their house, swept it up, cleaned it up, made it ready for an occupant, and then sent them on their way. And the Word of God said, when an unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he will eventually return. And he'll peek through the windows, and he'll see that the house is swept and cleaned and garnished or decorated, but it's not occupied. And he will then go and find seven friends worse than himself and all of them will return and take possession of that property once again. I've seen this happen with people. This is why Christians and preachers who run around thinking that they're hot shots and they can just cast demons out willy-nilly are, are acting foolishly. They're not acting in wisdom. They're not doing things the way they ought to be doing things. Because a person who is delivered from demons must, must come into intimate relationship with God. They must. They must make themselves available to the infilling the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. Because if they don't, they're leaving their insides cleaned out. They're leaving them swept out. Everything's been decorated, but it is still empty. If they have any hope in the world of remaining free of all devilish and demonic influence, they must come into relationship with God. Why do I use that terminology that they must come into relationship with God? Why do I not simply say, you know, they need to uh, believe in God or they need to start going to church? No, no. No, that's not what they need. Listen, the Lord admonished His disciples in Luke chapter 10, verses 16 through 20, to always keep things in perspective. Don't celebrate the benefits of being a child of God. Celebrate the truth that you are a child of God. No matter what we're able to do as born-again believers, we must always remember and rejoice in the fact that God went to great lengths to make us His own, so that as His own, we could do those things. Some people, for instance, will focus on speaking with other tongues rather than focusing on receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. But the tongues are evidence of one's having received the Holy Ghost baptism. Therefore, we ought not to seek to speak in tongues, but rather to be filled with the Spirit of God. So, it is for the believer 
when it comes to authority over sin and the powers of darkness. These things are the byproduct of our relationship with the Lord. Listen to me. These things are the byproduct of our relationship with the Lord. When we become part of the family of God, we become royalty. Hallelujah. And with royalty comes privilege, authority, and power. In 1 Peter 2 and verse 9, the Apostle Peter writes, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in times in time past were not a people, but ye, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. When we become a born again child of God, we become royalty. Hallelujah! We become a royal priesthood. Hallelujah. In Revelation 1, 4 through 6, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince, listen, and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Verse number six, listen carefully, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Hallelujah. And hath made us kings and priests unto God. Hallelujah. Peter said, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, kings and priests unto God in Revelation 5, 9, and 10. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood, by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Listen to verse 10. And hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you, it's not important uh, to go to church. It's not important to have religion. It's not important to follow some code of morality or some code of holiness. What is important is that you come into relationship with God when you are born again, born of the water, born of the spirit. You literally become a king. You become a priest unto God. You become somebody with power and authority in your life. And even demons will tremble at your word. Even demons will tremble at your presence. You will have nothing to fear. Oh, when you understand who you are, as a child of God, you can live a fearless life. When Prince Charles speaks, he speaks with the power and the authority of royalty. I guarantee you that when Prince Charles 
request something that people jump in order to do what he says to be done. I guarantee you people get on the ball immediately in order to fulfill his request. Even though he's not king, even though he's a prince, his mother is the queen, but still he is royalty. He is a member of the royal household. And therefore, as a member of the royal household, there are benefits. There are uh, people will do things for you that they wouldn't do for anybody else. People will immediately jump up to accomplish what you've asked to be done. Why? Because you're royalty. I've got news for you today, child of God. You are royalty. Therefore, you need not live a fearful life. You don't have to be worried about sickness. You don't have to be worried about disease. You don't have to be worried about death. You don't have to be worried about uncertainty. You don't have to be worried about tomorrow. You don't have to be worried about lack or want. You can and know as a child of God, I'm a king, I'm a priest under God. I have authority in my life. I have power in my life that God has given me by reason of our, listen, relationship. Glory to God. The Lord said in our primary text today, not to the twelve disciples. The word of God said, Seventy returned again with joy. Many people think that much of what the Lord said in His ministry and during His public ministry, He said only to the twelve who would become known as apostles. But the truth of the matter is, Jesus had a much greater following than merely the 12 apostles. No, the 12 were called by Him. They were individually called by Him. They were uh, called to follow Him by Him. He called them into a special relationship. He called them into a special position. He called them into a special ministry. They would serve a unique and special function as time would go by. But that was not the sum of all who followed Jesus. No, there were many, many more who followed the Lord. And furthermore, all of those who followed Him received the same benefits and the same rewards. In verse 17, Luke 10, the Lord said, and the, uh, the Word of God said, and the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Oh, hallelujah. In Mark, the final chapter, the word of the Lord tells us that prior to Jesus' ascension, he said, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not harm them. They shall lay hands upon the sick, and they shall recover. Jesus, in telling his followers to wait in the uh, city of Jerusalem until they be endued with what? With power from on high. The word of God said that the Lord spoke to his followers and said, And ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Hallelujah. 
Oh, too many believers are walking a powerless life. They're unaware of the authority and the power that has been invested in them by reason of their relationship with Almighty God. Hallelujah. You become a king. You become a priest. The authority, the power of that kingship, the power of that priesthood is yours. By reason of your relationship with God. Oh my goodness. When Prince Charles speaks, people jump in response to his power and his authority as a member of the royal family. But when Prince Charles acts specifically on the Queen's behalf, and therefore, in her name, it is no longer he that acts, but rather she. She is, in this instance, acting through him to achieve her desired end. When a child of God speaks in the name of our Lord, that child of God no longer speaks as or on behalf of him or herself, but rather they speak as the Lord himself. Look again at our primary text today. The Lord began by saying, listen, he that heareth you heareth me. Hallelujah. Oh, when you come into relationship with God, when you're born again the Bible way, honey, I've got news for you. Everything from financial troubles to sickness and disease and even devils no longer hear your voice, but they hear His. Yes. Hallelujah. Woo! Glory to God. My Lord, have mercy. How many children of God walk in this knowledge? How many children of God walk in this revelation? Too few, I'm afraid. In 2 Timothy 1, verses 6 and 7, the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. He's referring to Timothy's having received the gift of the Holy Ghost as Paul the Apostle laid hands on him. Verse 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Hallelujah. It sounds to me like God has given us the means to live fearlessly. Glory to God. Hallelujah. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 14 through 18. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. You remember Jesus said, going back and talking about the Holy Ghost and, he, and trying to help you understand that the Holy Ghost and Jesus are one and the same. He said, in that day, you'll be in me and I'll be in you. Remember? And, and you look at that and you're like, well, what in the world does he mean by that? What is he saying? But then look at what John just said. John said, Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God. And God in him. Herein 
is our love made perfect that we may have boldness when in the day of judgment talk about something a lot of people are fearful of start thinking about judgment day and people get afraid uh, as a child of God you can live fearlessly there's no reason for you to fear oh I, I shouldn't even be fearful at judgment day no not at all listen John the Apostle said herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is so are we in this world there is no fear in love but perfect love casteth out fear because fear hath torment he that feareth is not made perfect in love what is that telling us if you're living in a constant state of fear if you're living in a constant state that you're going to be lost that you're going to go to hell that God is going to somehow reject you then honey something is not right you're not walking in relationship with God as you ought to be walking you're not understanding how this works God has provided the means whereby you can walk fearlessly there is no need for you to be fearful of Armageddon there is no need of you to be fearful of hell there is no need of you to be fearful of judgment why because when you love God and God loves you and you understand that familial relationship that the two of you have come into then sweetheart you have nothing to worry about there is nobody that wants you to succeed more than God does there is nobody who has done more to help you win than God has. And there was there is nobody who will defend you more in the end than God will. Hallelujah. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. Therefore, you have no need to be fearful. Fear brings with it torment. The Apostle John said, but love is able to dispel the torments of fear. In Matthew 10, 28 through 31, Jesus said, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Oh, hallelujah. God has provided a means whereby we can live fearlessly. Honey, if God's aware of a sparrow that falls dead to the ground from the branch of a tree, if God has gone to the extent uh, of, of literally numbering every hair on your head, then you better know He's got His eye on you. You better know that you're in His care. You better know there isn't anybody in this world wants you to succeed more than He does. There is no cause for fear. There is no need of fear. In Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 17, the Apostle Paul writes, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Paul said, ye have not received 
the spirit of bondage again to fear. But, listen, the language here is very important in Romans 8, 14 and verse 15. But ye have received the spirit of adopt adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Oh, hallelujah. What's he talking about? He's saying, you have been adopted. You have been brought into God's family. You have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but instead you have received the spirit of adoption. Hallelujah. You have come into familial relationship with God. God is royalty. You now are part of a royal family. Hallelujah. With that position in the royal family comes power and authority. Hallelujah to yes, God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Amen. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so, be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. You want to talk about God being on, the, on your side? You want to talk about coming into relationship with Him and the minute you come into relationship with the Lord, honey, you couldn't have a greater advocate. You couldn't have a better friend. You couldn't have anybody who wanted you to succeed more than He does. Listen to what Paul said in Romans 8 verses 33 through 39. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? In other words, he's saying, who would dare bring accusation against one of God's people? That's what Paul's saying. It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded, I am convinced, Paul writes, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. My goodness, it sounds to me like we have nothing to fear. Am I telling the truth? Sounds to me like we as children of God can live fearlessly. Praise the name of the Lord. As the children of God, we no longer have need of any fear. The issue is not that God is for us or somehow that God is on our side, but rather that we have become something. We have become someone that needs not fear. Yes. We can walk and talk and live as royalty, understanding our status and our station as the offspring of the Almighty. Too many believers go through life 
failing completely to understand their new position in the world as children of the King. The Word of God declares Jesus Christ to be King of Kings. Now, growing up as a kid, I always thought that meant all the kings of the world are under Him. He's the King of all the kings. <laughs> oh no, they ain't nothing to Him. If, they, if they're not saved, if they haven't been born again, if they're not walking in relationship with God, a king ain't nobody. You think that title means anything to God? You think God cares about the title uh, prime minister? You think God cares about the title president? You think God cares about any uh, chancellor? You think he cares about any of those positions? No, no, no. Those are man-made positions. Those are man-made titles. Those titles are meant to... Uh, carry with them some weight in this life. But honey, if you're not walking in relationship with God, king or prince or chancellor or pauper, it doesn't matter to God one way or the other. No, He is king of kings. Listen to me now. <laughs> because as His children, we become kings in our own domain. The Bible said we have become kings and priests. Therefore, He is the King of kings. Hallelujah! Oh my God! Oh, hallelujah! Glory to God! We don't think about this. We don't walk in this knowledge. We're fearful of the devil. We're fearful of the enemy. We're fearful of sickness. We're fearful of disease. We're fearful of uncertainty. We're fearful of death. We're fearful of life circumstances because we don't know who we are. Not who's on our side. Who we are as born again children of God. Hallelujah. God made us. He made us kings and priests. You didn't do it yourself. God did it. Through the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, you have been made a king and a priest unto God. You forget who you are. You forget what God has made you. And you will walk in fear. You remember who you are. And you remember who God has made you. And you will walk fearlessly. Oh, my great God in heaven. Too many believers go through life and they don't understand that their new position in the world is a child of God. They don't realize that they've become the king in their home. They become the king in their family. They become the king in every area and every aspect of their life. They are the king of their domain. Got news for you. Sickness, disease, depression, demons have no power over you. You are the king of your domain. You determine what is allowed and what is not allowed. You determine what is permitted and what is not permitted. You determine what has access and what does not have access. The enemy has no power in our minds, in our families, in our children, in our communities, in our homes, in our bodies, unless we allow him to possess such power. As the Lord admonished in our primary text today, always remember and rejoice in the fact that you are a child of God. Never forget that. When that is your primary thought, your primary belief, your primary conviction, there is no obstacle that can stand before you and there is no devil that can obstruct your path or thwart your journey. Ephesians 2, 18 and 19, For through Him 
we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners. Listen, ye are no more strangers and foreigners. What is this telling us? This is telling us that God has changed us. We were strangers. We were foreigners. But, Paul said to the church at Ephesus, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Hallelujah. We are royalty. Holy Ghost filled people in Pentecostal churches. Oh, a lot of critical. A lot of our Baptist friends. A lot of our non-spirit filled friends want to look and criticize and oh they just want to find fault with them crazy Pentecostal people who stand around shouting and dancing and running the aisles and acting in church like a bunch of drunken idiots but I'm here to tell you what will make a Holy Ghost filled believer shout louder than anything you can preach what will make a Holy Ghost filled believer sh uh, shout louder louder than any words you can sing are words that reference their being a child of God. They don't shout. You don't see them singing songs. Oh, the devil is under my feet. Oh, the devil is under my feet. And they're shouting and dancing in the aisles. But let them start to sing. He wrote my name way up in glory land. He put my name down on the roll. And boy, you'll start seeing Holy Ghost filled people shouting and dancing and getting happy in the Holy Ghost. Why? Because Jesus said, don't rejoice in that the devils are subject unto you. Rejoice that your name is written in heaven. You see, the demons being subject unto you are because your name is written in heaven. You are a king and a priest unto God. You have authority and power in your life that you never had before. You're able to live and walk fearlessly, fearlessly through this life because your name is written in heaven. Therefore, don't celebrate the other things Celebrate that central fact. Because it is that one fact that has changed everything. Wow. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Almost done. John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on His name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Oh, honey, when you become a born-again child of God, you don't just have God on your side. you've become part of a whole new family. That family you've become part of is royalty. <laughs> With royalty comes authority. With royalty comes power. You need to understand who you've become because your name is written down in heaven. Once you understand who you've become because He wrote your name down in the Lamb's Book of Life, you will never again fear anything because God has made a way through the blood of Jesus Christ for us to live fearlessly. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm.